Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for this third episode in our series on grasslands. I'm Jen Kavexis. I'm program director at the Salazar Center for North American Conservation at Colorado State University. This series is a joint effort to present this series. We've partnered with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, the Institute for Science and Policy at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and the Center for Collaborative Conservation, also at CSU. Uh, just so everyone's aware, this is the third episode in our series. We do have one more webinar next week, so I invite you to stay tuned for next week to close out the series with us. This webinar series was inspired by a large undertaking to conserve grasslands called the Central Grasslands Roadmap, which is a North American effort of combined hundreds of individuals and organizations working together toward resilient and sustainable grasslands in the diverse communities they support. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that people have lived on North American grasslands for thousands of years, and indigenous peoples are still very much present on grasslands today. We've tried to weave some of those themes throughout this grasslands webinar series, um, but where I'm sitting today is the traditional homeland of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. Just a few quick logistics, as already you already heard. We're gonna invite you to put your questions into the chat. We are really interested in hearing more about what you're curious to know more about grasslands from today's episode. Um, sadly, we probably won't be able to get through everyone's questions, but we'll do our best to weave some of those questions into our dialogue today. If you caught our first two episodes in this series, you know that in our first two episodes, we really explored the big picture science, ecology of grasslands and the various ways that people are dependent on and help manage grasslands. Today, we're going to dive in to a specific conservation success story that was decades in the making, and it's based right here in northern Colorado. I'm so excited today. We have two outstanding guests with us. First, we'll hear from Megan Flanagan as Land Conservation Planning and Resource Division Manager for Larimer County Department of Natural Resources. Megan oversees the department's land acquisitions planning, capital construction, natural and cultural resource management, education and volunteers. And if that wasn't enough, she also manages the trails programs. So she received her MS in natural resources from Colorado State University and a BA in biology from the University of Colorado in Boulder. Prior to her graduate studies, she worked for the city of Colorado Springs and Boulder open space programs. Welcome, Megan. Thanks, Jen. Looking forward to um, sharing with you all today. Excellent. Our second speaker today is Arvind Punjabi. Arvind is a senior research scientist at the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies in Fort Collins, where he works to conserve birds of Western North America through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. He has spent much of his 22 years at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies developing partnerships and local capacity to advance bird conservation in Latin America, especially in Northern Mexico, where he currently coordinates a network of ranchers to voluntarily conserve and enhance habitat for grassland birds. Arvind has published over 20 peer-reviewed scientific articles on the ecology and conservation of North American birds, including a landmark paper on the loss of 3 billion birds from North America since 1970. He works closely with partners in flight and other national and international groups to coordinate bird conservation priorities among agencies and conservation organizations. Welcome, Arvind. Hi, Jen. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Well, Megan, if you want to get started with your presentation. Okay, great. All right, Jen, I trust you can see that okay? Yes. All right. Well, thanks so much for the invitation um, to join the webinar. And um, as Jen mentioned, I'm Megan Flanagan. I work for Larimer County, it's Department of Natural Resources. Um, Larimer County is the north end of uh, the Front Range, and um, our department, the Larimer County Department of Natural Resources, is um, one that has been around uh, since the 50s with the um, construction of the large reservoirs up here in Larimer County as part of the Colorado Big Thompson Project. So Horse Tooth Reservoir, Carter Lake, if you've, if you've been up to enjoy those spaces. And in the 1990s, we, uh, as a community, passed a sales tax, like many other Front Range counties and, and West Slope counties in Colorado, to help acquire additional lands and conserve additional lands uh, for the purposes of protecting wildlife habitat, creating buffers between communities, 
buffers to other public lands that already existed in the county, um, to provide close-in recreation opportunities uh, to our growing communities at that time, um, and then to um, protect other values, scenic values, um, separators between the, the uh, different cities. And um, we, since that time, have uh, been fortunate enough to have conserved over 55,000 acres of land within Larimer County with partners. Some of that land we've acquired in fee simple, so it's owned by the county, and we manage it uh, in many cases for natural resources val values, uh, ecological outcomes, but also providing some amount of appropriate public access. Um, and then the other 50% of those lands we've acquired, we have done so via a tool called a conservation easement. And that's one where the land is still in private ownership with private landowners. That landowner can continue to, in many cases, uh, graze their property, um, enjoy it as, as they have, uh, but it generally restricts in perpetuity certain development rights. And so um, by doing that, we don't, um, it doesn't have public access, but it achieves protection of many of the values I, I described that we look to conserve. Uh, we have a master plan that guides our work, and um, this is available on our website if anyone's interested. I saw there's some folks from Fort Collins joining us that might uh, want to delve into it a little bit more. But our master plan has 12 priority areas. Uh, this is a map of Larimer County. You can see uh, Wyoming at the north end, uh, and then I-25 um, over here on the, the east boundary. And these 12 priority areas really guide where we do land conservation work. Um, you can see in green on the map are already conserved, uh, primarily Larimer County owned properties. The orange are conservation easements. And, um, and the priority areas are highlighted as sort of the shaded bubbles. So a lot of that um, area, um, you can imagine, um, provides conservation of many of the values I described. So, for example, if you look at this region just west of Fort Collins, we have a lot of public open space in that area now, a lot of um, trails, trail systems close into the communities. It conserves the hogback and um, the scenic vista to the west of Fort Collins and Loveland. And then we've also conserved quite a few conservation easements through there to buffer those lands and, and protect some additional conservation values. Um, so for today, we're really gonna focus on this northern part of the county um, where we've done quite a bit of conservation work to date. And we call it the Laramie Foothills Mountains to Plains Project. So here's a, a close up of that area. And um, there's an imaginary line that didn't show up on my map uh, that again is the Wyoming Colorado state line. And over on the, the east side is I-25. In this area, the Laramie Foothills Mountains to Plains area was identified in, in Larimer County um, and the city of Fort Collins and the Nature Conservancy's planning efforts over the last um, 30 or so years. And it really stood out as an area where we could achieve incredible conservation outcomes because this part of Larimer County is really um, at low jeopardy of development, had very little development um, as early as the, or as late as the early 1990s. And there was also quite a bit of conserved land on the Western portion. So you can see this checkerboard of Roosevelt National Forest in the dark green, some tan uh, car, or state of Colorado, state wildlife areas. And uh, this red circle basically shows where we look to really target trying to create a connection from the mountains to the western, from the western side where already federal and state lands had existed um, through several ecotones from the montane as you head east to the grasslands um, and the edge of Larimer and Weld County's boundary. Uh, to date, since we uh, worked with a lot of private landowners and were able to conserve lands in this area, um, through fee simple acquisitions like Red Mountain Open Space and Soapstone Prairie Natural Area that have public access, um, as well as through conservation easements. Everything again in the orange are uh, numerous conservation easements. We've conserved over 60,000 acres of, of land since 
around the year 2000. And so uh, just include a few photos to give you a sense of this landscape because um, it's hard to imagine unless you've seen it <laughs> or you have some idea from these photos, really the scale of land conservation we've been able to um, accomplish in this region. So this is a, a photo standing on the Wyoming Colorado state line looking south, primarily a red mountain open space. Um, and you can see the, the interesting diversity of um, Mount Mahogany shrublands, which is a very rare plant community in Larimer County, um, which is the shrub in the foreground of this picture, interspersed with grasslands. Uh, there's numerous perennial and ephemeral creeks that uh, traverse the landscape. Um, this is specifically soapstone prairie, which is um, predominantly short grass prairie, but also includes uh, shrubland and, and riparian communities. And then um, the last thing I'll just touch on is, is for us, one of the amazing things about having been able to conserve land at this scale, especially as connected as it is between public and private land. Um, those fee simple and conservation easement acquisitions it's allowed us to look at managing these, this landscape in a different way than we would say a couple thousand acre uh, you know, uh, open space that might be more landlocked or surrounded by um, development or, or closer into communities. And one of the key things um, it's allowed us to do is look at how, to, how we can uh, reintroduce species that would have been native or um, historically found on this landscape. And over time, we've uh, been able to reintroduce uh, native fish, uh, worked on ferret reintroductions, and re, um, reintroduced or manage a, a herd called the Laramie Foothills uh, bison conservation herd um, across Soapstone and, and Red Mountain. So with that, I'll um, stop talking and turn it over to Arvin to talk a little bit about uh, some of the monitoring that we also do at Soapstone and Red Mountain, um, specific to grassland birds. Thanks, Megan. That was a great introduction. And um, we'll jump right into the, the bird section of this uh, hour. So, uh, Whereas uh, mammals like bison and pronghorn and prairie dogs and ferrets tend to be more familiar to uh, many uh, people in the public, uh, grassland birds are uh, actually the most diverse group of vertebrates that uh, live in grasslands. Uh, they still are a pretty small group of birds when we think about all the birds in North America, of which we have roughly 700 species. Uh, grassland birds, depending on how they're defined, uh, represent a group of somewhere between 30 to 50 species of birds in North America with varying degrees of uh, dependence on grasslands. Uh, and we're going to be talking today specifically about grassland birds that uh, breed in the Great Plains. And many of these species are found nowhere else on Earth uh, and found only in uh, native grassland habitats, like this chestnut collared longspur you're seeing on the right of the screen here. Uh, but in general, although they're a small group of birds, grassland birds really um, are quite a diverse group taxonomically, ranging from owls and raptors to shorebirds to songbirds, and in particularly sparrows, uh, North American sparrows, which are native to the continent, not the house sparrows that we have in our towns and cities. Uh, but that group of birds in particular is a very diverse group of birds for our grasslands. So I'm going to give a little overview about these birds and talk. Uh, just briefly about uh, the role that the Laramie Foothills Mountains to Plains project has played in the conservation of these species. Now, I'm gonna start off here with a, a slide. So turn up your volume. I want you to imagine yourself standing in the dark in a wide open prairie just before the dawn. And soon you should be able to hear the sound of the dawn chorus beginning to surround you growing in volume and variety. And again, please turn up your volumes on your computers if you don't hear the bird songs. Now in the prairie, the barrage of bird song emanates from the ground and sky in three dimensions, bringing a surreal feel to what is otherwise a uniquely two-dimensional landscape. 
And in the early morning, you can't see the birds, but they let you know they're there. You might hear the clear, cascading whistles of a western meadowlark, the melodic rhythms of a lark bunting, our state bird in Colorado, or the high, thin trill of a grasshopper sparrow. There are other birds in the grasslands as well, wetland birds, such as killdeer, marbled godwits, pied-billed greaves. Together, all these birds create a symphony of sound uh, that is unique to our prairie landscapes. Now, sadly, this opportunity to hear these birds is disappearing and becoming harder and harder to find as grasslands across the Americas continue to be lost uh, to farmlands, to exurban development, uh, to meet the demands of our growing population. So as a result, grassland bird populations uh, are one of the most endangered groups of birds on the continent. All right, so birds of the central grasslands. Uh, this is a fairly discrete ecosystem, as you see, uh, contained entirely within the Great Plains of North America and the Chihuahuan Desert of Northern Mexico. And uh, the birds that live here remain pretty much in this area year round, moving between the Great Plains grasslands and the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands. That's over 90% of the migratory species that nest in the grasslands. There is a small group of birds that migrates onward to South America, to the Pampas grasslands in the southern cone of Brazil and Uruguay and Argentina. Uh, but like I said, 90% of these migratory species stay within the central grasslands region and uh, roughly split their time between the northern Great Plains and the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands. So they're dependent on both ecosystems. And this uh, graphic on the left here just shows an overlay of the breeding range maps of those species of birds. And you can see there's a high concentration of species in the northern Great Plains and likewise in the uh, Chihuahuan Desert in winter. Uh, so you may have heard from some, if you participated in some of the other uh, series of, uh, of speakers uh, earlier in the month, uh, that grasslands are a product of the physical and biological environment, uh, both where they are located on the continent and the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains uh, and the grazers that live within in them shape the grasslands to be what they are and help maintain them. And the grazers in particular, the bison that uh, Megan mentioned, uh, also prairie dogs, and, uh, and today cattle are grassland ecosystem engineers. And these birds or these mammals are really important for the birds uh, because they literally create the spaces between the grass that the birds need to be able to move through uh, what is, can otherwise be a thick, tall grassland. So I'm going to refer to this graphic uh, created by Fritz Knopf uh, over 20 years ago, but still does an excellent job of conveying the importance of grazing to create the habitat niches that grassland birds need on the landscape. You may look at a grassland and think it all looks the same, but there are actually uh, unique niches uh, and unique conditions within the grasslands that are critical to supporting certain species of birds. So as you can see in this graph, there's a group of birds on the left that are closely linked with high grazing pressure. Uh, these are birds like the mountain plover, uh, the McCown's longspur, now been renamed the thick-billed longspur, the ferruginous hawk. And then there's a group of birds that have a little broader niche and can occupy both the very short grass and moderate to tall grass grasslands. And then another group of birds that requires taller grass and uh, even shrubs in those grasslands uh, for their habitat requirements. And again, the grazers are essential to creating all these niches for the birds. So without grazers, and today that is cattle, uh, we would not have the diversity of grassland birds that we still do. Uh, but the grasslands of the uh, Central North America have suffered a lot over the years. They've been reduced through development of croplands, uh, which now occupy the majority of what were formerly grasslands. Uh, they've been fragmented by roads, 
infrastructure for power lines, energy development, and degraded uh, in other ways through long-term overgrazing, and loss of vegetation cover, uh, and those grazing pressures also create a phenomenon known as shrub encroachment in the grasslands where shrubs begin to uh, thrive under heavy grazing pressure because they're not eaten and eventually take over the grassland and transform it from a grassland to a shrubland, at which point it no longer can host that unique assemblage of birds. Uh, invasive species, invasive grasses in particular, are also another big concern for birds and other species in the, in the native grasslands. So uh, Jen mentioned at the beginning that we recently published an article about the loss of birds in North America. And uh, shockingly, we found that since 1970, we have lost 3 billion birds from North America. That's roughly 29% of all the birds that we had on the continent back in 1970. And it may come as no surprise that grassland birds are the group of birds that have suffered the most. In fact, out of those 3 billion birds lost, one out of every four of those was a grassland birds, uh, a grassland bird. So in total, we've lost 53% of all the grassland birds on the continent. That equates to 720 million birds, roughly, and fully 75% of grassland bird species show statistically significant negative trends. Uh, all this determined through long-term continent-wide bird monitoring programs that uh, have been ongoing since the late 1960s. Uh, but the situation for our birds of the central grasslands is in fact even worse than what this story shows. Uh, birds that breed in the central grasslands and winter in the Chihuahuan Desert, which are again 90% of the migratory species that grassland species, those birds have actually lost around 70% of their total population since 1970 and they're declining at a rate roughly twice as fast as other grassland birds on the continent that are found in the east or further west. So the Soapstone Prairie and Mountains to Plains Conservation Project, these have had a tremendous impact. I don't know, uh, I mean, we I think folks knew at the beginning that this was an important area for grassland birds, uh, but uh, after the city and county acquired Soapstone back around 2005, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies began doing inventories uh, of the grassland birds on the property to find out what was there and what their populations were like. And uh, we found that this area was home to 20 species of grassland birds that are of national, regional, or state level conservation concern. Uh, so it's a critically important site from a continental perspective. Uh, even small as it is, uh, this map on the upper right reflects the short grass prairie region. So you can see the small dot there in northern Colorado that represents the Mountains of Plains project. So even though it's a drop in the bucket, so to speak, it is critically important to all these species of birds that we are losing throughout much of that region. Uh, and another interesting thing about this project that I'll mention, uh, and then we'll uh, get into some discussion, um, is that the protection of the lands in the Mountains to Plains area, uh, we were able to leverage the, the investment uh, made in a lot of the acquisitions, not the soapstone property itself, but some of the properties around there, uh, and leverage those uh, to obtain federal grants through the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act to expand the impact of that investment to focus on grassland bird conservation needs in northern Mexico, which has been the focus of my work for uh, the last uh, almost 20 years. Um, so uh, this investment has done more than protect just an important area in Colorado. It's helped protect lands in Mexico and helped uh, fill research gaps and information gaps uh, about those birds uh, on their wintering grounds. Now I'll leave you just with one last thought. Uh, Megan did mention that we have been doing extensive monitoring on the soapstone and some of the other properties in the Mountains to Plains area. And uh, this graph is just to show that there are challenges uh, despite protecting the land uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that the species found there will persist. 
oftentimes we need to take other actions to help manage those species because the world we live in today is so much different than uh, what it has been historically. And of course, when we're talking about migratory birds, these birds also depend on areas outside of soapstone and outside of uh, Colorado. So uh, we need to be thinking about their full life cycle and clearly factors elsewhere in the life cycle can influence the trends that we see here in Colorado and here in the mountains to plains area. So whereas birds like burrowing owl have been able to persist through uh, some turbulent years, um, uh, they are now doing quite well in the area. Uh, these data only go through 2017, uh, but uh, unfortunately a couple of other species that depend on similar habitats. These are the short grass obligate birds that are found primarily in prairie dog colonies uh, and thus are subject to uh, changes in prairie dog population and density. Uh, a couple of these like the mountain plover and the thick-billed longspur are in decline, even in the mountains to plains area. So we need to find uh, solutions on how to uh, prevent further declines and recover their populations. And with that, uh, I think I'll turn it over and uh, open it up for discussion. Thank you both so much for that. That was amazing. Um, Arvin, I think I want to start sort of where you left off a little bit. I mean, you both touched on the notion of the connectivity across this landscape and the importance of having diverse ecotypes of different sorts. I'm wondering if maybe, um, you know, we could just start there and elaborate a bit more on what you've learned from working in this landscape about the importance of that scale and connectivity and, and why it's important to some of the goals for the mountains to plains efforts. And maybe Megan, I'll just start, we'll just start with you and then Arvin, if you wanna chime in that we could do that. Yeah, great, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think um, one of the, things we were lucky with in this area is that there aren't too many places on the front range of Colorado where you could make a connection from the grasslands, in this case on the east, to the montane uh, systems on the west, just because our, our communities have generally fragmented that. I-25 fragments that. Um, some of our larger systems and urban uh, developments fragment that opportunity. So, um, in fact, the only other couple examples I can think of are down you know, near Trinidad and south of Pueblo, where there might still be opportunity, or there's been work towards that, um, as well as the Greenland Ranch in the um, Larkspur area between Castle Rock and Colorado Springs. That's, that's been achieved to some extent there. So, um, you know, it's, it's been lucky that we were able to have the opportunity to do that, or the um, opportunity still existed at that time. And, you know, a big part of that, what we think about in doing that is we, as a single agency, and even with our, our partner agencies that do land conservation work in Larimer County, the City of Fort Collins, the Nature Conservancy, Colorado Open Lands, and some of the other land trusts, don't have enough money to acquire everything and manage everything into the future. So that, that again, is where we really look to um, use tools like conservation easements and keep some of that land in private ownership, but make sure it's conserved and, and contributes to creating this connection across, in this case, about five ecotones, um, and that those conservation easements are well-written and um, those landowners are some of the best stewards that, that we have and, and know to help leverage our dollars and efforts in, in achieving that, that landscape scale goal. Great. Ar Arvind, do you have any additional thoughts like, on how that connectivity and uh, landscape scale sort of affects the goals or outcomes for the bird populations and the diversity in, in that area? Yeah, definitely. Scale is a really important issue for birds. Uh, scale of habitat uh, and connectivity. Of course, birds have the advantage of being able to fly between disconnected habitat patches. Uh, but uh, the importance of scale for, for example, for breeding populations uh, really cannot be understated. Uh, birds uh, don't just exist 
like in a vacuum. Uh, you can't just have one pair, uh, you know, of a chestnut collar long spur persisting in an area for a very long time. They require populations. Uh, birds are social animals. Uh, they, uh, they, birds will attract birds basically. So you, you need to have other birds breeding in an area for other, for birds of that same species to persist in that area. Uh, so in order to support populations uh, of these grassland birds, we need to have large expanses of contiguous grasslands. Uh, so scale and the, you know, the degree to which that is true varies a bit between species. Um, some species can occupy smaller patches, uh, but in general, larger patches of grasslands uh, host more diverse uh, communities of grassland birds. Uh, yeah, the you know connectivity uh, on a landscape uh, scale or or even continental scale here, uh, you know the soapstone and mountains to plains area is part of one of roughly 60 grassland priority conservation areas identified in the central grasslands region that uh, the birds will use throughout their life cycle as they move north to south and south to north. Uh, so having, even though they're not connected physically, some of these grassland patches, these large areas, uh, having, uh, you know, the, the full complement of, of areas for grassland birds across their range from breeding to wintering areas is critically important. Um, it strikes me also, Megan, as you were talking about that, that connectivity or the, the all the lands that that mountains to plains space occupies, that must have taken a lot of collaboration to, to bring all of that together, those different landowners. And I know you mentioned one or two of those partners, but I wonder if both of you could talk a little bit about how collaboration has helped with the mountains to plain effort and um, how that was sustained over time. I mean, 30 years of, I think you said approximately, or however many decades this has been an effort, um, that's a long time to sustain. That kind of that level of collaboration and outcomes. So um, maybe if you would just want to elaborate a little bit on how how all of that came together and working across all those different agencies and bringing private landowners into that mix as well. Yeah, I'm happy to go first, Arvin, if you don't mind. And um, yeah, thanks for bringing that question up, Jen, because I don't know that there's anything we do without collaborating in our department because we we just really rely on so many different partners, whether it's technical experts like the Bird Conservancy or um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service for helping identify grazing regimes and um, putting together our grazing plans. Um, but from an acquisition standpoint, back in 2000, to 2003, 2004, when we were first um, acquiring Red Mountain Open Space and Soapstone Prairie in partnership with Fort Collins, it really required us to do um, a lot of outreach with a lot of the private landowners that work in this area and develop strong relationships because we only work with willing landowners. And um, we, at that time, were able to apply for a large grant with Great Outdoors Colorado as well, which really was the key to us being able to afford to acquire those two key fee ownership pieces. And over time, we've received other grants to build off of that. So um, Arvin mentioned some of the properties we've bought in the last 10 or so years that have been in holdings that have been used towards uh, match for some of the Bird Conservancy's grants. And those were largely successful because of all the years of getting to know those landers, working with them, and having um, trust and relationship um, that they were willing to sell it to us. <laughs> um, but we, uh, now that we're, we've acquired a lot of the lands and we're not, we're not finished um, yet with some of our, our goals as far as land conservation goes, but a lot of our focus is on management of, the, of um, these fee simple properties and cross boundary management with our conservation easement partners. And that looks a lot like working with people like Arvin to, to monitor and adjust, um, to um, plan around recreation. We have about um, 
35 miles of trails between Red Mountain Open Space and Soapstone Prairie. And we developed our management, initial management plans and subsequent updates in, in partnership because most of us have no idea who owns what property we might be hiking on, especially in this case, when you cross an imaginary line. And so having that consistent um, look and feel to the trail system, um, a lot of our cross boundary weed control, um, because like birds, weeds don't live in a vacuum either. They move <laughs> between the properties. And so really um, sharing our, our mapping, what we're seeing, the changes and adjustments we're making in all sorts of our management activities and looking that at, at, at that at a landscape scale as well has been key. Arvind, do you have any thoughts that you want to add to that? You're muted. Yeah, um, well, this whole project started as a collaboration. Uh, in fact, when after the city first had acquired Soapstone, um, the initial survey work that we did to you know, inventory all the birds there uh, was funded through a Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, State Wildlife Grant. So that helped kick off uh, sort of our collaboration with uh, providing information to city and county managers on, on the birds there. And uh, over the years, as we began to, again, collaborate with the city and county on using these investments as leverage for our federal grants from the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act, which requires three to one matching funds. And for these migratory grassland birds, this was a perfect opportunity to use the large investments of cash to acquire and protect land as the match to fund the complementary work that needed to be done to uh, research and monitor and protect populations on their wintering grounds and to monitor populations within the mountains to plains area as managers began to take ownership and make decisions on, on these lands uh, to see how the populations fared going forward. And we've been fortunate to uh, have been able to continue that monitoring work uh, pretty much every year since 2006. Uh, so we have a really long-term data set for uh, some of the bird species we haven't been able to monitor everywhere. We focused primarily on prairie dog associated bird species because those are some of the ones that we view as the most vulnerable. Um, but it's all, all the work has been done through collaborations uh, with both the city and county, uh, the state, uh, and, and as well as the federal agencies, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, again, on the wintering grounds where we've been uh, using most of the investment, uh, in fact, I think I said it's about 3.4 million in grant funds that have gone to uh, you know, these projects in, in Mexico and on Soapstone and, and Mountains of Plains area. Um, all the work we do down there is in collaboration with partners, uh, local NGOs and government agencies, as well, again, private landowners. Uh, and if it hasn't already been said, I mean, uh, one point that's important to take home from all this is that grasslands are probably the least protected terrestrial ecosystem in the world. Uh, and so there are very few national parks, reserves, et cetera, that protect grasslands. So all the work we do to protect grassland species has to be done with private landowners. So uh, the importance of collaborations uh, is not lost uh, on me. Yeah, so that's a great point uh, that you just touched on there, um, Arvin and Megan, you mentioned it as well, is, is that collaborative work with private landowners. And, and actually there's a question or two from the audience about how the, the conservation easements work with the private landowners in that landscape and how I'm curious, like the, the audience member is curious about how restrictive they are, but I'm, how I, I'd like to hear a little bit more also on, you know, has the collaborative, have the collaborative partners worked with the, directly with the landowners on changing up their grazing management styles or other um, aspects of land management to improve the grassland habitat for different ecosystem services. Yeah, those are great, great questions. I've been kind of watching the chat a little bit too, and um, I'm glad you brought those up. Um, so a, a conservation easement is a, it's a perpetual um, agreement between a qualified entity to hold the conservation easement. So Larimer County, the city of Fort Collins, for example, um, land trusts that work within the state of Colorado. 
and that private landowner. And so each conservation easement, while we have a template and um, often specific things we're looking for to conserve on that particular property, it is a negotiated outcome. So a particular landowner may want to retain the ability to allow hunting on their property. And that's something we uh, readily allow in a conservation easement. The next landowner next door might choose, I never wanna see hunting happen on this property. And, and that's okay with us too. So um, there's a lot of portions that we negotiate around. Um, grazing is a common one because of the landscape we work in in Larimer County. There's a lot of large ranches and a lot of those are in active grazing. And it's a practice we like to see continued um, and done so sustainably. And so in our conservation easements, we do have language around um, sustainable grazing practices. And we rely on a third party, if it's ever in question um, over time, because again, the conservation easement is perpetual. So if that uh, landowner sells their land to a new person, the conservation easement goes with it. And there could be a day where we go out to monitor on our annual monitoring and we're thinking it looks a little bit overgrazed or it's not, um, there's some practices that might not be as sustainable as, as we expect. And we rely on a third party in that situation, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, CSU has the expertise to come out and, and help broker that conversation about what needs to adjust or change to make sure those practices remain sustainable. We don't get closely involved in the management of those properties beyond ensuring the terms of the conservation easement are met because there's a, a cost to doing that and we just don't have that kind of capacity. But we do partner a lot with landowners to bring resources to them. So um, sometimes landowners, there might be an impediment financially to doing forest management was a question someone asked. Um, there are a lot of great federal and state programs to help support uh, financially and from an expertise standpoint, doing good forest practices. So the Car State Forest Service um, office here is here in Fort Collins has one and they do site visits and they have cost sharing and um, all sorts of programs that we often will link a landowner to them if we're seeing an issue on those conservation easement lands. Uh, within our department is the Larimer County Weed District and we have resources, expertise, cost shares, uh, things like that to help landowners do uh, good weed control practices. Um, interesting, yeah. Arvin, you've talked a lot about working with private landowners and is that, how does that look for you from the bird management perspective? I, I would imagine, you know, they have to change some of their grazing or other land management practices. Do you need to, does it work best with the bird oriented landowners or is, are they already willing because they're, you know, they've already been through the collaborative process? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So it's a pretty different situation for me working in Northern Mexico uh, with landowners there. Uh, there are no conservation easements uh, in Mexico. It's not available as a tool. Uh, so we have to come up with other kinds of solutions to implement conservation on private lands. Uh, so uh, back around 2012, we started a program there called the Sustainable Grazing Network. And it's uh, you know, geared towards private landowners uh, with the purpose of trying to create a network of protected grasslands uh, that provide for the diverse habitat needs of grassland birds across their wintering ranges in Northern Mexico. And uh, the way we uh, do that basically is to uh, sign an agreement with the landowner that says, we'll agree to help you with your land management needs. Uh, first, we'll develop a, a shared management plan uh, that identifies the needs from an ecological and uh, management perspective. And then we'll help address those needs together. And so then we'll cost share on projects that allow landowners to implement new grazing techniques that allow them to better control the timing and location and duration of grazing um, across different parts of the ranch. Uh, 
through the use of you know temporary cross fence uh, and you know water access. Water is a big component to grazing. They need to be able to have water to move the cows around. Uh, so, yeah, our our uh, collaboration with landowners is done on a voluntary basis, but through uh, a shared agreement that we both sign on to. And then, uh, you know, we basically assist them in implementing this management plan that uh, the goal of which is to create healthier grasslands, both for grassland birds. One of the big issues down there is overgrazing because it's a desert environment. Uh, overgrazing uh, can happen very easily. And um, so that is one of the needs that we specifically try to address, ensuring that more parts of the ranch are able to rest for longer periods of time. And that takes being able to use other parts of the ranches more effectively. Uh, so, yeah, so we work with landowners on a pretty different basis. I think we really do work with them on the management. Of course, they are the managers. They still control and do all the work uh, in terms of where to put the cows when. Uh, but we together, uh, you know, develop a, a management plan that's based on the ecological capacity and needs of the property. Uh, and then help steward that plan with them over a period of 15 years. So we're about 10 years into the program now, and we have uh, about 30 different landowner partners that we work with there on grassland management. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's basically an ongoing relationship. Excellent. Um, I'm curious, you know, at the end of your presentation, Arvin, you touched a little bit on some of the monitoring data that uh, Bird Conservancy has been able to collect at uh, Soapstone and that in that area. Um, and it strikes me that, you know, one of the great things about the Mountains to Plain effort is the, the real realized vision of adaptive management of really integrating research and monitoring into the management decisions across that landscape, whether it's on the publicly held or indirectly on some of the uh, private lands. Uh, I just wanted to hear maybe if you could touch a little bit more on some of what you both have seen as a result of the monitoring and how that has influenced um, management decisions, whether for the bison herd or other species of interest in birds on the, the site. And maybe Arvin, let's just start with you and what you've seen from the birds and um, through the monitoring data. Sure. Uh, well, one of the big challenges that has affected not only birds, uh, but other species as well, there has been uh, prairie dog management. And, uh, you know, prairie dogs are susceptible to uh, bubonic plague uh, or sylvatic plague, I guess it's, it's properly called, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, carried by fleas uh, and spread between other mammals to prairie dogs. Uh, but it can completely wipe out the prairie dog population in an area in just a year. Uh, and we didn't used to have this problem in our area. It's it's a fairly new phenomenon, these plague outbreaks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so shortly after uh, the city and county acquired Soapstone, uh, a major plague outbreak occurred in the region that essentially wiped out the prairie dogs uh, from one year to the next. And uh, that was also followed by several years of very wet springs. Uh, so we had a lot of rainfall that transformed then these places that had recently lost all the grazers, the prairie dogs, uh, into a tall grassland. And uh, we almost immediately lost uh, some of those prairie dog dependent species like the mountain plover. Other birds like the thick-billed longspur are a little less dependent on prairie dogs per se, uh, but um, they were also negatively affected. So we've continued to monitor their populations and, and the mountain plover population in particular has been on the verge of uh, blinking out from the region uh, since about 2008. And I know that the city and county have been working hard to find solutions to address the prairie dog question because it's not just for the birds, uh, but also for ferrets, for example, that need these large colonies in order to survive. So they've been taking on some uh, additional management steps, again, in collaboration with uh, the state of Colorado, CPW, and um, to develop a basically an oral plague vaccine 
uh, and have been testing this on soapstone and, and meadow springs and some of the other ranches that host prairie dogs in the mountains to plains region. Uh, and it seems to be fairly effective in maintaining uh, resistance to these plague outbreaks and maintaining the prairie dogs. Uh, but that's an example of one of the types of management actions that uh, they've taken in response to seeing this dramatic decline in, in some of these important species. Uh, another approach that uh, was also uh, has been taken and has had some success is uh, conducting prescribed burns in some of these areas that uh, had lost prairie dogs. Uh, and that was also successful in bringing back mountain plovers, uh, although it has to be done regularly in order to keep those grasslands very short. Uh, and that can be a challenge in today's world with climate uh, being what it is and uh, so, and not wanting fires to get out of, out of control. So that's a couple examples. Great, Megan, do you wanna to touch on anything maybe um you know, how some of the research and monitoring influences how that, how the conservation bison herd is adaptively managed. Yeah, yeah, that, I'd love to share that example. And, um, you know, I should note that we do have cattle grazing on both um, Red Mountain open space and soapstone prairie natural area. And um, I was reminded to say so hearing Arvin talk about some of his work um, on grassland birds and um, Central and South America, because we, in effect, have created a, a bit of a grass bank with Red Mountain Soap Zone by allowing local producers competitive leases to graze on both those properties and also allows them to rest their home place or, um, you know, move cattle in a different way and, and adjust their own management practices, maybe stay on the land longer and on their own private ranches too. And um, a number of years ago, when we started looking at the idea of, of um, introducing bison uh, back to this landscape, we had the good fortune of connecting with CSU and the USDA, uh, CSU's Colorado State University here in Fort Collins, and the US uh, Department of Agriculture. And they have a, a Foothills campus on the west side of Fort Collins, where they were doing a lot of work with bison to um, be able to remove brucellosis, which is uh, a disease in bison that's endemic in Yellowstone. So it's been an issue with being able to move Yellowstone bison um, outside of Yellowstone National Park because brucellosis is a really contagious, terrible, um, spreadable disease. And they came up with a methodology to remove um, the genetic material from those bison in Yellowstone which still have um, very little introgression of cattle genetics, which is unusual in most bison not within Yellowstone National Park. And they can do an enzymatic wash and remove brucellosis from those embryos and implant embryos into um, other bison and produce a calf with those Yellowstone genetics. And the challenge that they had is they don't really have a lot of space out there at the Foothills campus. They have a pretty tight paddock they were keeping these bison in. So we established in partnership with Fort Collins, Lerma County and, and uh, CSU and the USDA, this Laramie Foothills bison herd that you can see if you uh, drive up County Road 15 on your way to uh, Red Mountain and Soapstone. Um, and when we originally established the, there's a 3000 acre pasture that we've designated as our bison pasture, because we still see the benefit of having uh, local producers and cattle grazing to meet other objectives on this landscape. Um, so we identified a specific bison pasture and with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, looking at our grazing plants and capacity, we, we estimated about a hundred bison or cow calf pairs would be the right capacity for that pasture. And uh, the bison have been on site since about 2015. And just this last year and a half or so, the herd has grown to just a little over a hundred cow calf pair. And so when we, all, all the work we do on our uh, public lands, our open spaces and natural areas, we are constantly monitoring management actions or things that we're applying and doing. And uh, the bison pasture is no exception. 
because we're really managing these bison as we would if they, they were cattle in the same pasture. It's a, it's a small area relative to, you know, the eight, late 1800s when bison, you know, crossed the landscape and weren't fenced in. And uh, we've determined over the last year or so, partly, you know, we were in a drought year last year, um, and the bison have got to that capacity point that we were seeing some impacts to the range that exceeded the, the goals we have for um, how we want that pasture managed. So we're actually re in the process of reducing the bison herd um, right now. And, you know, it's something we see will ebb and flow over time. It may grow back in a few years to be able to be closer to that 100 cow-calf pair. Maybe it could exceed that in a certain year. Um, but, but the last thing I'll say about the bison herd is the, the ultimate goal of this herd is that Red Mountain open space and soap zone are just a landing spot for them for a period of time. And the ultimate goal is to be able to send those animals off to other herds around the United States. And we've been really successful doing that um, over the last five to seven years. Uh, in fact, about 40 bison were just sent to different tribal lands in Oklahoma and Nebraska just a couple weeks ago. So by reducing that herd, it doesn't mean we're eliminating those animals. They're pretty valuable animals given their genetics, but we're able to, once they've gotten all the close in veterinary care, the genetics uh, management here at CSU, it allows them to be able to be sent somewhere else and establish uh, herds with those genetics elsewhere. That's amazing. Um, and I would, I would encourage the audience, if you're, if you're ever having a rough day and you just need a pick me up, go look at the Facebook page for that bison herd because the photos and the videos of the bison playing out in that beautiful landscape will definitely uh, improve your mood for the day. Um, we just have a few minutes left. I'm so sorry we didn't have time to get through all of the audience's questions. There's some great questions, but um, maybe just to close out, I'd love to hear from each of you, you know, what, what keeps you motivated and inspired about working in that mountains to plain environment? Um, and Arvin, maybe we can start with you. Gosh, well, uh, one thing that keeps me motivated through the Mountains of Plains project is that it really is like a crown jewel of uh, the whole, you know, natural protected area system we have, uh, you know, locally here in Northern Colorado. It is an astounding prop property aesthetically, biologically, uh, and it's such a unique model in that, uh, you know, it still involves the local community. Uh, the local ranchers who used to graze on the soapstone grazing association are still part of the equation here. Uh, so knowing that uh, we can make an impact on the ground and we've seen it through the bird populations in other areas, I didn't get to some of the more positive aspects of population change we've seen, but uh, knowing that we can make a difference locally is what keeps me motivated to keep working towards uh, bird conservation on a continental scale. Yeah, I would I would echo that. It's seeing real uh, the real benefits and the the conservation outcomes, whether it's the land or the practices. It's working with our grazing lessees and partners like Arvind and um, private landowners that inspires me. So I'm glad to be able to share with you all today and um, look forward to the session number four. I'm sure you're going to talk about Jen. Yeah, for sure. So everyone, um, thank you, Megan and Arvin, so much for this conversation today. It was wonderful. I love all of your insights and your expertise is amazing. Um, and I just want to encourage the audience to participate in our fourth and final webinar in this series next week. We'll have a little bit more of a focus um, bringing all of this, what we've heard over the first three together and thinking about how that wraps into policy and solutions moving forward. It'll be an excellent conversation and I definitely encourage you to participate. Um, all of these recordings will be shared with you um, after the series is done um, and made available again. So please join us next week and thank you for participating and thank you, Megan and Arvin again. Thanks for hosting us, this has been fun.